Hi, Roman. Hi. Welcome to the Growth Calibre podcast. Thanks so much for making time to Thank you know, you. spend uh, your time, your precious uh, time with us and share some insights and some nuggets about Thank what you've you done so, so much, far. Man. Thank you so much for having so me. So I have um, a few uh, questions for you uh, yes, to understand more from you about what you have done and mm-hmm. what is it that knowledge that you have garnered over so many years of your entrepreneurial journey that you can share with the audience. Sure. Happy to share. Thank you so much for having me. So the first question, um, can you take us back to your early days of your career, probably even your college days, mm-hmm. and then share with us what sparked you, the initial spark that lit the fire in you to get into this entrepreneurship space? So um, I hail from a family of businessmen. We are Gujaratis. So, mm-hmm. I mean, just to type cast our, our uh, people. Business is always the default. Mm -hmm. Doing a job is not the default. Before on the way before entrepreneurism became so, so called sexy, Mm -hmm. it uh, was always the default. So the plan was always to start your on your own. It was just to learn the ropes that you probably did some projects and whatever, Mm -hmm. and you learned the ropes. So there isn't a big great story which says, "Oh, you know, I met this person and this is what happened and this is how I got inspired." It just was the default path. And um, so from college, we had begun, I had begun a company, which along with a classmate of mine, we were taking on a few classmates, actually. And we were taking on some projects and, and doing them on a bespoke basis. And then, of course, for some time, we did a, a, an internship, call it an internship or a project for a big name brand company, mm-hmm. worked with, a, um, with another big name brand company for a year understood how these things happen and when my stock options in that company were vesting uh, in the 11th month that means they would say now you can keep your stocks okay. uh, somehow I felt something was not right because mm-hmm. if I keep those stocks then they expect me to stay longer it's not fair for me to take it and then leave so if the plan was to anyway leave don't take the stock so didn't take the stocks and left and started on my own so you never thought of actually taking up a corporate <clears throat> job or something like that? No. Never, that, it never, that thought never came to your never, mind? Never, never. Never was okay. part of the plan. Okay. Okay. Sure. Okay. It's called in, in among the business community, it's called doing service. So you're, oh, he's doing, oh, he's doing service. Okay. Service salli dhan. That time, you know, service kar hai. Okay. It's kind of like that. So you have to do business. It's just how it is. All right. And just to, as a follow-up to that question, what motivated you to take on these ambitious uh, projects that you, uh, you've worked on, uh, you know, building and scaling three companies, right? Right. Yes. Three, so yeah, this is three. take us through that. Uh, what, how, what, what was the motivation? To so this? obviously, once you start your business, you, um, if you're doing something, may as well do it well. So mm-hmm. the motivation was, of course, that you want to make a name. So you just... So I remember clearly going to a workshop where they said, who do you admire the most? Mm-hmm. Okay. And back then, this was, I'm talking 1996 time frame, 98 time frame. Uh, most of the people had Bill Gates as their figure of admiration. So okay. always you wanted to say you'll do something of that scale. Of course, none of my three ventures are three ventures. I've always co-founded with people. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were not that scale, but the inspiration was always to hold a an icon in your mind yeah. mm-hmm. and that sort of becomes your guiding factor also what would that person have done if this situation came you know that kind of thing as right. much as you know about that person so sure what have been some of the challenges that you faced and how did you take inspiration from these icons so the biggest challenge for if you leave the icons aside because mm-hmm. the challenges that they may have faced may be different from ours but in all three businesses the biggest challenges that they were all B2B businesses. So okay. they were all never B2C. And so in B2B, I think there's a big chicken and egg situation mm-hmm. where how do you get your first few clients without having any references? Mm-hmm. And how do you get references without having any <laughs> clients? So it's, you know, there's a chicken and egg. How do you do work without experience? And how do you get experience without okay. doing work? It's, it's mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So that was the biggest challenge. So we've always found some uncanny ways of trying to get the first two or three clients. Okay. And in all the businesses that I think is what worked very well. I think that's an important step to overcome. Whether you're a services business, like the first one was, the second one was slightly productish, the third was fully product. Okay. <clears throat> The first few clients, you don't segregate them 
Mm-hmm. Especially if you're in a business which needs to make money from day one. Mm-hmm. None of the three businesses I had uh, had VC funding or there was no funding. It was all internal growth. Right. So mm-hmm. like traditional old businessmen from the very first transaction or at least the second, you need to start making money. Mm-hmm. So um, with, with all B2B, the first two or three you know, deals where you, you make money and you still are able to run for the next and so on. That, that I think is the key. That's, I mean, for each type of business, figuring that out was very exciting. So how did this growth story happen for you? I mean, uh, you said uh, getting the first two, three clients was the, uh, you know, that's the learning curve, I guess. So, uh, and once you got those three clients was, can we say that your growth story kind of stabilized or? No, I think that's when it catapulted. That's when it really, there was like a hockey stick. The first two, three will never be the big ones. But for us, luckily, in the first com- second company that we had, which was uh, AWPL, got rechristened to Candela Labs. Mm-hmm. I think where we got our first couple of clients was we got um, Mr. Arthur and Tata, Tata mm-hmm. Sons, as mm-hmm. our first client. Okay. We got Arthur Anderson as our first few clients, Telco. All right. And I think that showed me from my earlier company, we had... There was, we were going with smaller clients mm. and we realized it takes as much effort to go to smaller clients and close deals mm. as it does to go to larger clients. And so we just chose the larger clients. And uh, I think that worked very well. It taught us a lot, it taught okay. um, them a lot because software was all nascent back then in B2B. Mm. And um, <clears throat> showing about people a product. Okay. This, well, Arthur Anderson, Tata Sons, etc. happened in 99, 2000. And okay. then after that, 2002 or 2003, we had the uh, Asia's largest insurance company put its faith in us. That was Prudential. Okay. And okay. Uh, that was an interesting story. My co-founder, oh, that's the other thing. Always, I mean, I've always felt that having co-founders is a, is a big plus. And I'm all with all of them, I've had co-founders. And having co-founders who have different talents and skills, mm-hmm. extremely, you know, is extremely useful. So one of my co-founders, he went there, IBM was pitching, Oracle mm-hmm. was pitching, there, there were big names. Were big and, names we are, yeah. Yeah, and we are some, someone called Automated Workflow <laughs> in some Banswadi or something. I mean, who's going to kind of look at us in Kuala Lumpur, right? So when he was presenting, he saw that uh, the execs in the room, it was like a huge U-shaped table when he's presenting. Um, they were not interested. So midway through, he just shut his uh, laptop down. He said, guys, mm. this is not working. I don't think this will interest you. Mm. But the one thing I'll tell you is mm. that we care mm. and we're passionate mm. and we'll do. I mean, you know, this was not exactly our first client. We had finished Arthur Anderson, Ratan Tata and so on. So the trust factor was there that we were good. But okay. then why us rather than someone else? Eh? Right. Um, we're big enough to, to make it work for you, but mm. small enough to care. Okay. And then he put that down and he said, <clears throat> so let's talk about our passion and let's talk about partnership. Forget the tech, forget your solution. And mm-hmm. that's when things came alive and we cracked that big one. Okay. And after that, of course, it was that was the largest one. And then all the others followed. So that's the customer centricity part, right? Yes, so- it was. Yes. I, I think uh, making sure that you speak into their listening, right. making sure you serve what their concerns are, mm-hmm. even in the sales cycle, not only after. Mm-hmm. I think is an important piece, okay. especially in B two B. I don't have I don't have experience in B two C, but I'm I'm certain that holds you in B two C. Mm, absolutely. Um, <coughs> so uh, that was ninety nine two thousand around ninety nine two thousand two thousand two ish as well. So it's almost twenty five years since then. Yes. Yes. How do you think entrepreneurship space has changed? What do you see in today's entrepreneurial world, and what? Uh, what works in today's uh, entrepreneurial story compared to say 25 years back and where do you think the blind spots are which entrepreneurs should consider? Some things remain the same. They're classic. They're timeless. For example, how you form your team, Mm -hmm. the founding team, Mm -hmm. I think has remained pretty much the same and should remain. For example, even if you're three founders, four founders, two founders, whoever, make sure your roles are the same. Are, 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 are not the same, sorry. Your roles are all defined well. Mm-hmm. Who is an executive? Maybe there are some only board members. There are some executives. Who's the CEO among them? Mm-hmm. There has to be a first among equals because there will be a difference of opinion and then which way do you go? There shouldn't be a log jam. So that, that remains common. 
Another thing that remains common is the purpose for which you're built. Mm -hmm. uh, are you built to sell or built to last? Are you a lifestyle company or are you... A... So having those conversations in the beginning is, is an important piece. And that remains whether it was entrepreneurship 25 years ago, whether it's entrepreneurship now. Okay. Um, <clears throat> the things that have changed are certainly the pace mm -hmm. at which entrepreneurship um, brings itself fruit. So earlier, three years to five years was a good window. Okay. Now, one and a half to two, three years is the window by right. which you have to prove yourself. Yes. Otherwise, you're considered the walking or living dead, meaning you're, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> you're not yet dead, you're living, but you're not going to grow. Because is, the, is what people pronounce you as. Okay. That happens much sooner now than before. Okay. Um, the other thing that's changed is... Is that good? Um, well, it's just keeping up with neither good or bad. It's just a thing. By, okay. It's neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just okay. a thing in itself. It's just a way yes, of our times. Yeah, Everyone yeah. wants video shots. Nobody watches, reads long form articles. So it's the same. Nobody has the patience to wait for five years for a business to turn, pivot and become successful. Okay. I think one and a half to three years is what you're given. Okay. As age. <clears throat> the second thing that's changed is just a lot of money. Mm. Um, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, VCs were not even a thing. Mm. There was Menlo Park and if you were really that good, you'd go there and you'd, you know, you wouldn't be out of India. And uh, it was very well known that VCs would never come. They would never fund a company if they had to, uh, if they had to travel more than two hours from their office. Mm. That was like a saying back then. Okay. Okay. Right. Whether by flight or whether it's by driving or whatever, that's it. That's, that's the radius of influence or whatever, the sphere of influence. Uh, obviously all of that has changed now. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Most of the blue blooded VCs are in India and have an India specific fund and several India specific funds. So okay. that's changed the availability of capital. The outlook to business itself has changed. Mm -hmm. Earlier, the outlook to business was uh, um, you had to be profitable. Mm -hmm. You had to make money. Mm -hmm. um, now the business outlook is you don't have to make money. I mean, look at Shark Tank and out of the folks there, I don't think any of those uh, those businesses make money. They make losses, Absolutely. thousands yes. of crores, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. And you're still a great businessman. And I mean, kudos to all of them. Uh, obviously, with a lot of respect, I say this. But that's what has changed between then and now. <clears throat> so I think you think it's good, the build-up of an entrepreneurial story, this model, mm -hmm. what we see today? Um, I think it's good for some cases, but bad for some. And I'll tell you what I mean. If you're making losses in the beginning because it's a tech heavy, it's an investment heavy business mm -hmm. where you need the money, you're burning that money, but you know over a period of time it's going to grow mm -hmm. uh, once the investment is made, then that's a great sweet spot. For example, if you're developing some algorithm of some sort, it takes the time, you need those kind of people mm -hmm. and finding applications for it will take some time. But once you find it, it'll scale like, you know, mm -hmm. uh, hockey stick wise. But so for those kind of situations is good. But I have seen some businesses where there's no way in which there's, it's going to make money mm. at all. It's, mm. it's, they're, they're paying money to get customers. Mm. So the moment they stop paying that money, customers will go buying away. Buying the customers. Yeah, they're buying the customers. So it's like saying, you know, I'll come with the 70 cents, I'll give you a dollar. And so there will be a queue outside your door. But the moment you say, come with a dollar and I'll give you a dollar, nobody's going to queue outside your door. So those kind of business models will probably not work. Okay. Um, and, and those are bad. But uh, I think VCs, everyone's, there's, there's a curve they've also gone through. So I think with the fun winter that they call it the funding winter and so on, that's really what has happened. Realism has set in. So mm. hopefully there will soon be a balance. Mm. You you mentioned about <clears throat> how, say, 20 years, two decades or so back, uh, organizations could take about three to five years to, you know, prove themselves to grow. Yes. And now it is expected to happen within 18 months or 24 months. Right. Does this hold good for organizations that are either funded or not funded? Or is there a no, everyone, difference? Everyone. No, two? everyone. If you are already a six-year-old company and you're approaching your first round of funding, people will still ask you why a five-year-old company. People will ask you, why you, you've been in it for five years and you've reached these numbers? Mm. Why are you in it? What is, you know, so you will be questioned whether it's your first round of funding, your fifth round of funding or fourth or whatever. It doesn't matter. But the the speed to perform is, is, is higher. It's critical. Right what has been your take on funding uh, for yourself? You, 
you we have, and we've had exactly we've had this conversation and you said you were always bootstrap right how did that work for you how why is it that you never looked at the funding uh, part is it that you just didn't require it or you were you had a different thought process about taking external funds versus no it depends on the idea it depends on the idea okay i don't think the ideas needed that kind of funding the idea if the idea was heavily investment oriented like i said if i was developing a whole new let's say multilingual llm or whatever with indian languages mm-hmm. i know that it's going to take a while for me to even start making money okay then obviously i would have looked for funding okay. but the ideas were such that i knew we could make money in the first second third we we could do that mm-hmm. uh, maybe we were limited by our thinking where we didn't think of ideas which needed that much funding maybe it was the other way around as well don't know mm. we'll have to relive our lives to see that but at that point i don't uh, the ideas matter mm. so funding is neither a good thing nor a bad thing by itself it depends on what the idea is and okay. if it needs funding by all means go and get it i'll come back to this point a little later sure. in terms of your advice for entrepreneurs Most if they are looking for funding um just to you know take up a little more about your professional journey um you have had an impressive professional journey yeah, we've you. you know covered that uh, in the introduction so what are some of your personal passions um that you believe shaped your perspective about how um uh, to established that leadership position in this particular industry that you worked in sure and why this domain mm-hmm. was there a specific reason you chose of course you were an entrepreneur but you chose this specific industry vertical so what was the reason behind that and sure so some of the passions of the founders flow into the passions of the company and becomes mm-hmm. the culture of the company mm-hmm. then whether you're 300 people or whether you're you know three people I think that follows okay. in in my opinion at least I've seen that in all the businesses I've worked with even now um <clears throat> so some of the passions we had were always uh, our middle names as you would call it would be constant learning so as long as this constant learning for the organization for the client who's with us and our people who are with us I think there was a um we we excel in that Mm-hmm. so the moment there was no constant learning over a period of time the culture became such that we would refuse such kind of orders or we wouldn't you know there was there had to be constant learning okay the second was excellence mm-hmm. and the spirit of never letting the customer down mm-hmm. we had this peculiar custom where as soon as we got a project how many of our projects we got mm-hmm. towards the end we would be getting like more than about 80 90 projects in a year but even then mm-hmm. um for every project the team would get into a huddle and Uh, towards the end of course it was a virtual huddle okay. but literally it would start with we will not let the customer down right uh, with our product with our services with whatever that happens mm-hmm. and sometimes we'd go over and beyond and the client saw that okay. and the client would say that's what true partnership is so i think okay. that was the second passion to never let your client down very old fashioned values but and the third is of course good. <clears throat> they do hold good your question on what's different in business these things are still old fashioned right um the third is of course making sure your people are treated well mm-hmm. and you have a lot of fun while you're doing what you're doing right i think having fun along the way because um it's tough the entrepreneur's journey is tough it's right. like um, you know there used to be i think there used to be an ad for sailors earlier mm-hmm. that um i'm talking about the 1600s and so on mm-hmm. where they used to have ads for sailors which said that um, uh you may have you know the journey is dangerous mm-hmm. it's exciting whatever return not guaranteed and if okay. you come back glory not guaranteed <laughs> and yet you go through that so that's right. really what entrepreneurship is also and uh, so it's going to be that perilous so you may as well have fun while you're doing it it's going to be pressure otherwise all the time so that was the third i think well passion slash culture of the companies that we all you know all the co-founders all of us have found and i think that stood well for us what yeah. was the second part i missed the second part of your question now what shaped uh, your perspective to actually uh, you know uh, zero uh, in uh, on the on industry sure. this particular industry mm-hmm. vertical So um what happened is uh, we had a mentor so i always recommend that all entrepreneurs have a mentor and we were our platform was the last company that we had which we exited just now 
it was a horizontal play. It mm-hmm. was an intelligent automation play with AI built in and so on, mm-hmm. automation and all of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had the Department of Agriculture in Philippines as a client. We had the Water Supply Department in Malaysia. We had 7-Eleven, which is a department store in Thailand as a mm-hmm. client. Mm-hmm. As much as we had uh, Tata Sons and we had Arthur Anderson mm-hmm. and we had Prudential, which was an mm-hmm. insurance company. Mm-hmm. Because everyone needed automation. It's effectively the same technology. Sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, but with our mentor then, what we did is that um, he said, I think you need to narrow down your ICP, what is known as the uh, mm-hmm. ideal customer profile. Mm-hmm. And we first kicked and shouted and fought and we said, no, we shouldn't do it. Mm-hmm. Uh, because we had so many prospects. I mean, Oberoi group of hotels was almost close to closure. Okay. And then there was some other hospital group which was close to closure. And there was another insurance. And then if we pulled the plug at that time, People would say, you know, we say hotels, no, hospitality, no, uh, hospitals, no, whatever. And we say only insurance, for example, which is what we said. My sales guys would be up in arms. And we also as founders would say we lose so much. And the mentor said, no, no, please just just stick with this. Okay. And that year, I think we did three times the business. The day we said no to everything else, and we did said yes only to insurance and banking. We did three times the previous year's business. So uh, we learned an important lesson, which is less is more. Right. Less is more. And that, I think, helped. Because the moment you start focusing on a a vertical, you get your stories right, Mm -hmm. the pitches land, your product uh, starts getting built in a specific direction. Okay. Mm -hmm. And if you want, you can always build it in two layers. One's a horizontal layer, which keeps increasing. So tomorrow you want another vertical added you can and then there's a vertical layer on top which is a domain layer right uh, you can always build it intelligently but the strategy should will will probably be shaped better mm. if you're seeing a vertical now okay uh, I, there is one more one of the startups that i'm mentoring just now and they asked me that question suppose we don't do a vertical mm. and i said it's it's still fine to do a horizontal but a narrow horizontal which says okay I'll do anything which has got to do with scaling open source software. Okay. So that the client, your ICP is anyone who buys open source. You know, basically you should identify either a niche horizontal or a niche vertical. Okay. Where every morning, if your salesperson opens the yellow pages, now virtual yellow pages, there's mm-hmm. no yellow pages anymore, but mm-hmm. they open that, they need to know where to go to and then who they call every morning. You know, the three or five calls that they make, which are cold calls, Mm -hmm. whether it's your inside sales, your salespeople, depends on your structure. But they need to know who to call. And it can't be everyone. It can't be the whole yellow pages. That's like kind of not a a good uh, sign. So, So whatever helps you define what your salesperson, your outreach person is going to do in the morning Mm -hmm. for that week, Mm -hmm. I think is is good enough. That's, That's how I like to segment it. Okay. So that's how we, then we did our, um, so we could have chosen any of the verticals, but we just did a thorough analysis of all our clients, our pipeline and numbers mm-hmm. suggested themselves. Insurance was the best bet. So we went then and it was uh, also, so that was an inside out, our pipeline and so on. But the outside in was that, you know, in terms of technology adoption, they were almost the last back then. Okay. Uh, you know, everyone said banking is an extremely conservative industry mm. and they're last to modernize. Back then, right now, of course, with the UPI, India is a different scene. Mm. But everywhere else in the world, they are very conservative. They'll be the last ones to bring new tech in mm. and adopt tech. And after that, insurance comes in. It's like that, okay. right? It was known to be that. So we said, yeah, the years where we can make a difference. So okay. the outside in story matched up with our inside out story and we chose. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights. No can you share a moment from your entrepreneurial journey uh, that tested you, right? Not just the professional resilience, but also your personal limits and, you know, your uh, uh, resilience. Interesting. Very interesting. Um, with all entrepreneurs, this will happen. I just read a tweet. There was some article this morning, Dipender Goel, that said, we ran out of money six times, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. right? So um, that happens to most entrepreneurs, especially those, well, he was funded and yet they ran out of money. Mm-hmm. We weren't even funded. Mm-hmm. So that those kind of moments test you the highest. Okay. What do you do at that time? Do you fire clients that are not working? Do you fire people? Mm. Do you go and find ways to get the money 
overcome cash flow. I remember one sort of peak candle or peak AWPL moment mm. where I think in 2012, mm. all of us founders got together and we said, we don't have money now. We'll have to borrow money from Cindy's mm-hmm. at 36% per annum. Okay. And, um, okay. Which is what it comes down to if you calculate it and okay. you can't prepay the loan and so on. Mm-hmm. And we, of course, worked everything out. But the point is at that, that stage, we did major pivots. Mm-hmm. One was to verticalize, but the second was to just change our roles. Mm-hmm. And so my advice to entrepreneurs is don't, um, don't go into a pigeonhole and say, I'm sales, I'm tech, I'm operations. It's okay to juggle that around. Take the time to kind of juggle it around. So at that time, uh, folks said, um, Romil, why don't you take on sales? And I was all tech, tech and operations and so on. And my other three co-founders were sales and said, let's shake things up a bit. Maybe it'll work. It was working. We had large clients with big clients, good projects. It was a cash flow glut in a sense. It was not a, it was a cash flow problem, not as much a inherent business problem. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. But in any case, they said, let's shake things around. Mm-hmm. And I said, uh, no, I don't want to shake it around. I don't want to do sales. And they said, why? And I said, because I've never done it. Mm-hmm. So then our mentor was also there. He said, uh, why would, so you've never done it. So what? Mm-hmm. So I said, 300 people's lives depend on it, their family. And I have to predict beforehand how much sales I'll make. Mm-hmm. The CFO is going to ask me every month, you know, and so on. So I've never done that. Mm-hmm. So then the company will drown if I'm not there. So then he pulled me to the next room mm-hmm. and he said, Romil, just think of introspect. Mm-hmm. Are you worried about the company drowning? Mm-hmm. Are you worried about you looking bad that you were at the helm of it? And then it drowned. Okay. Okay. And when you uh, do that level of introspection, you realize that it's actually so much of you sitting there. So it was me. I didn't want it. I didn't want to be held responsible for the company going down. Or in my mind, I didn't want to be in the forefront. So Mm. he said, then overcome that because it's going down anyway. No, it's for you to, whether it happens on your watch or not, what difference? And that inspired me. We came back in the room and I took over sales and then okay. we, we did, that did make a big difference. Uh, that's what my and before sales, it was pure technology. Pure tech, product, pure tech. Right? all the products were okay. built by me, the tech okay. was built. Um, I mean, with my team, of course, the whole okay. team. But I think that was a testing moment and that sort of asked for a lot of introspection and, I, and we did that. But uh, I mean, just thinking about the point that you mentioned, don't you think the best person to sell your product is you yourself? If you, no, no, these were all co-founders. Okay, the, all the co-founders. The, all co-founders only were selling, so there was okay. no, there was no lack of quality in terms of selling. They were okay. the, the passion, the rigor, everything was there. Hmm. But I think shaking things up helped. Hmm. And coming from a software background or a tech background, there always has to be a process. Uh, sales guys can't come and tell me I had a good meeting. What's a good meeting? There's no, right. I mean, did you go in with a set of set of criteria which says if A, B, C, D happens, then I'll consider it a good meeting. Right. Then come out and say oh, only A, B and D happen. So it's not a good meeting. Mm. I mean, unless you quantify why yes. is a meeting good or bad? What yes. is the meaning? I don't understand it. Right. Because I genuinely didn't coming from a software background. So I think putting in that kind of rigor and process and um, and having a certain methodology. In fact, we moved sales from a lot of art into mostly science, 95% mm. science. Mm. And I think that helped. So mm. I think shaking things around that way uh, brings in different perspectives. Mm. And until I was always on all the board meetings, I was a co-founder, we were all together. But until you're in that those shoes, you'll never think like that. Right. So mm-hmm. um, I highly encourage that roles yeah. be juggled. Uh, just taking cue from those points, the quantification part and having specific KPIs mm-hmm. to measure what it is that you want to drive. I mean, there are a lot of, uh, we talk about uh, OKRs, we talk about mm-hmm. growth. So how has this, uh, have you, first of all, have you tried any of these management models like OKRs? Second, how did, the, how did this quantification, bring, building in that accountability and ownership, how did this help you move from where you were which you said was, you know, not in a good shape. And where did it take you? So let's take the last five years. Um, we, we had a five-year 
OGSM, so to speak, a larger sort of goal yeah. where we wanted to reach in five years, then broke it down to three years and then one year. Yeah. Now, of course, nobody has a crystal ball and you can't gaze and predict, but that was the going in sort of plan. Then, of course, you'll pivot along the way. So given those objectives, I think without having those objectives, if you have only the annual ones or quarterly or half yearly, um, especially businesses of mid-sized businesses of between three, three, four hundred people and twelve hundred sort of people, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it uh, things could dwindle because you could have objectives which have local maxima, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So they are good for that team and it maximizes the productivity of that team, but it's overall minimum. Okay. You know, mm-hmm. so having a an overall maxima and then bringing it down to teams and and having local maxima for each of them, mm-hmm. I think is important. So okay. that 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 part helped, and then of course then the whether you call it MBO, which is very qualitative, quantitative driven, or you call it OKR, which has qualitative as well, of course all measurable, right. but uh, a mix of the two. Uh, whatever methodology you call it, I think it's very important to have a methodology okay. to to do this. Mm-hmm. And for that, uh, what worked for us is, uh, at least in sales, I can speak for, for the sales side. And of course, there are equal number of examples on the production side, mm-hmm. um, implementation or product development or whatever. But on the sales side, I thought that the input parameters me- um, measurement mm-hmm. mattered as much as the output parameters. So if you yeah. didn't make six new cold calls mm. in that week, mm. you knew that over a period of time, your closure rates were going to go lesser. Right. So mm. it's almost like that, you know, the funnel, everyone knows the funnel is the hopper. How much fruit you put on top is the kind of juice you get, right. the amount of juice right. you get at the bottom. So we started measuring input parameters as much as we measured the output one. So we'd okay. say, look, we had the NBO meeting, which is literally um, 10 second update from each salesperson. Mm. But every Friday evening, how many new calls you made, how many uh, business, uh, you know, uh, NRO, sorry, mm-hmm. how many new calls, how many relationship based calls and how many were opportunities which were closing. Right. And you'd, you know, you'd see how many new versus not. And just by reporting it to the rest of the group, people um, started observing those numbers, metrics and so on and started changing them. And I didn't have to do a thing. They just reported it. They had zero new calls for the next three months. I wouldn't say anything, but just reporting that to the right. group made them start thinking. For themselves, and this is not good for me. So, right. so it works. So having so those it's a measures, discipline. it's a discipline. I think of the rigor, execution. rigor is extremely. Yeah. Right. You can have all the measurements, you can have all the OKRs you yeah. want, but if you yeah. don't have rigor, yeah. which is frequent enough, you ca- can't do it once in six months and once in a year. Absolutely. Uh, unless you do it frequently, it won't work. Yeah, yeah. Very valid points. A uh, couple of questions about the technology background. What, why? Uh, I mean, you have shared why this specific domain. Uh, looking back, is there a specific experience or encounter within this particular industry uh, that has less, uh, left a lasting impression on you in terms of the difficulty or the level of difficulty? How was it since before you chose the domain of insurance, you have actually touched upon several other but was there any specific challenges in this particular industry that you have faced? Yes, or, of what course. What has been the rigor? So, so I'll tell you the spe- I think you have two questions in one. Yes. Um, the first is any last any impression, lasting impressions from that industry, right. and the second is um, you know what were the challenges in that industry which attracted us to that. Of course, the challenges in that industry. That industry needed the most automation, mm-hmm. and behind our minds, we knew that it does good for people. Why do people may demonize insurance? I think it does good because when you buy insurance, you get peace of mind. And when you need the insurance companies, when you're at your lowest, either you, if it's life insurance, you've lost a family member. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's health insurance, you, you're not in good shape or your relative is not in good shape. Mm-hmm. If it's accident, it's personal loss, it's theft. Mm-hmm. You're Most often than not, the customer is not in a good shape when they're reaching out mm-hmm. to an insurance company. Mm-hmm. So whatever you can do to help that situation is generally helping peace of mind, you know, for everyone. So that was always at the back of our mind that it's not a sort of a an industry which uh, sucks on people's mm-hmm. blood. So it doesn't it doesn't 
thrive on on making money out of someone else of course every business has to make money but it also provides peace of mind there's a larger goodness to it mm-hmm. so that did drive us to pick that industry apart from the numbers and i told you the inside out and outside in right but the logically as a business decision you don't just think about whether you know you're doing good for the world you also need to make money that industry had the highest amount of paper other than government mm-hmm. which we didn't want to touch it had the highest amount of paper paperwork claims were coming in in paper i mean um, you know insurance policies they would take 15 20 days even till 3 years ago we we've, we've been in, we used to work out of 40 countries mm-hmm. we've been in countries where an insurance policy still took a month to issue mm-hmm. after an application mm-hmm. and then it became 15 days and there was like a big you know in in all the events they were talked about that okay. now they issue policies in 15 days then mm-hmm. became 5 days three. i mean you can do that in a day so just bringing that change i mean there was that much gap mm-hmm. it was that underserved it still is okay. in many areas mm-hmm. uh, i think there there are so many areas in insurance that can probably be so better but anyway the point i was trying to make is that the business also made sense for us to choose that so there was this goodness for mankind and there was the business potential and gap and then there was also and then coming to your second question the lasting impression i do remember of course implementing our software it works very well we had our f- version 3 was a very orange hue purposely made orange okay. because one morning when everyone goes live and they all log into a new system and the papers are all locked and people can't it was spectacular you cannot access paper files from 1st january when your this system starts okay and mm-hmm. so when people log in you just see a sea of orange so obviously you feel okay. very good but that's still a very us feeling but i think what left a lasting impression on quite a few of us my me and my colleagues is when there was a i don't know if you remember but there was a malaysian airlines flight that got went missing yes and yes. i think quite a few indonesians and in that it was from right. somewhere in malaysia or somewhere in indonesia mm-hmm. and there was an indonesian company that was a client mm-hmm. and while their law their policy stated that unless the bodies uh, unless the person is not found for x days i think it's 7 or 10 or 3 mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. um, we don't consider that as dead and we will not disburse the money okay but this thanks to our systems we could make out what's happening the systems detected what's happening and brought out the names and so on and they actually within a day disbursed the claims amounts um and that was because of our system and we fa- and and we saw videos of those families receiving those of mm-hmm. obviously there was loss and obviously mm-hmm. they were grieved right. but at that time with these people going in with that mm-hmm. uh really helped and the fact that we played a role in that Well, made us feel proud that's a lasting impression i will not forget mh340 i remember yes it was right? mh340 that's correct yeah right okay cool um what's your advice on organizations on how they should prepare for growth and scale um and how do you think models like ogsm or okrs can help in this journey well i i like i said earlier without an ogsm or i mean why don't you you are the expert can you expand ogsm objectives objectives goals, goals strategies strategy. and measures right so without the longer term objectives goals strategies and measures i think having okr or mbo whichever whatever name you call it kpis and kras and whatever uh, i think there's a big danger that it, they could not be all disjoint they could all be disjoint and not come together right so i think having that focus a uh, discussion is important okay and before that i mean large companies obviously have all of this i'm talking on mid to small companies small where you need to draw up this yourself mm-hmm. and among co-founders you'll realize unless you go for a 3 day workshop for an offsite everyone has a different view of what they want to do with the company someone wants to sell it in 4 years and scale it someone wants to say as a lifestyle company or a bequeath it to my uh, next generation mm-hmm. someone says um, you know we want services someone says products i mean there's a lot of variation there mm. the second thing is you also need to have that workshop with the founding team and not just founders because some of them may believe they are shareholders but they may not be mm. some of them believe they are part of the founding team and are founders i mean there could be the reverse mm. and you may feel they are founders but they are just acting like employees they may go elsewhere so having a very clear conversation with the founding team and the founders on 
on equity etc mm-hmm. is important so having that first bit lays the right foundation for growth okay and then having that five year plan and change it every year by all means okay okay right because situations will develop especially yes. in the newer fast paced world they will they will you know they will always overtake you mm-hmm. so be agile by all means but have that larger plan and then have this uh, every year then half year then quarter mm-hmm. monthly measures and weekly calls sure. i think extremely important all right the, so it needs the, to flow the, from the, the top yes, hr can't just do it Absolutely. so if your hr person can, comes to you and says let's do okrs and le- before that let's do ogs and you'll say yeah i've got to meet this client i've got to do this and and this is ops problem and you, why don't you come up with something and we'll see right uh, i i don't know whether that will work i think the not founders need yeah. to uh, right. probably buy into the whole uh, absolutely aspect of how important it is great thank you thank you so much for that um looking ahead uh what personal aspirations or goals do you have um that extent going forward and how do you envision your professional legacy aligning with your personal values mm very interesting and i'm going to give you a very counter answer if you'd ask me about a year and a half two years ago when i was still in the corporate world mm. i've just about taken a break now and a lot of self introspection meditation all of that uh, my answer would have been different two years ago and my answer is different now mm mm-hmm. one is about leaving a legacy mm. um quite honestly unless you're doing something earth shattering um your legacy will be only one or two generations max for most people if i may just pardon me for the interruption but you have left a legacy i mean you have had three successful exits so let's Correct. talk about that but it will, so that's good and we do have frequent get togethers there are people who call me for their i mean the stock options we gave to people their nephews nieces their children have got married because of that and they still have lots of money left over so that's all been good uh but you know if you still go back to the philosophical and that thank you so much for pointing that out and but that's not what i meant when i said your legacy will not be more than one or two generations you'll be a photograph on a wall mm. for your next generation and the one after that you'll be a name and the one after that nobody will know you okay is very important is very important to understand how small we are in the scheme of things yeah. um so i think legacy is a much misunderstood term so mm-hmm. just do good for people around you at this point in time mm-hmm. make a change in their lives make a difference in what you do have fun while you're doing it uh that's all is in your hands mm-hmm. then whether you become legacy people remember you or not uh and how they remember you is different i mean mahatma gandhi left a legacy but there is a big debate on whether he was a good person or a bad person Correct. it's going to happen yes, yes so that's not in your hands you just yes. do what you have to do so yes. i think that is what people must i think understand and do for this limited time what's good i know it's very anti what everyone says everyone i've met every entrepreneur says for generations i want i want to send the rocket to the moon and bring it back and land it back because then for generations like i'm certain that's right as well mm-hmm. but i think that's right in terms of the contribution made and not your legacy the name need not live on okay the contribution needs to live on okay it's time uh, are you yeah. saying it's time bound what we are talking about no no but i uh, no i'm just saying not a legacy that no the other way around i'm saying remove yourself from the equation from you don't need to be the legacy right what you do may be a legacy and may be overtaken because of the speed of the world i mean I'm certain the first guy who made ice blocks and was shipping it across from Antarctica to mm-hmm. wherever where ice was needed was a path breaker mm-hmm. and uh, they there was a legacy for a while and something overtook it refrigerators were built uh, so for a while the legacy was there so you must make things you must invent you must you know all of that has to be there entrepreneurism right. is at the heart of everything and so you must do that but just know that you have to remove yourself from the equation you're not the legacy the the thing you're building hmm. should be of legacy value okay okay and forever long it lasts yeah yeah sure so any um, you know um, important insights or advice you have for entrepreneurs young entrepreneurs and students who may be listening to this podcast what do you have to say to them what are those two three things that they should keep in mind when they embark on an entrepreneurial journey 
um, what are some of the do's and don'ts that they they need to keep in mind, especially when they are young and oh, yeah, hungry I think, for. I think we covered a couple of them. So the risk yes. of repetition one, and I will therefore be brief. One is understand that the journey is perilous. Mm-hmm. Understand that entrepreneurism probably one in ten, or I don't know the numbers, but one in ten succeed, nine out of ten fail. Mm-hmm. You have to be ready for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, pivot, do whatever you have to, and uh, think on your feet, and you will make it succeed. Mm-hmm. It does take about a thousand days for a B two B company at least uh, to find its feet and make mm-hmm. it. Work okay. So that's roughly about three years. It mm-hmm. just does take that long. You'll find your feet about in the one and a half two years okay. time frame. But stick the course, stay the course, and but make sure the course changes as you know um, as it's required. But stay the course of entrepreneurism. Okay, right. Um, that's one. So it 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 will there there is a mortality issue there with um, with the with startups. So that's my first advice. Second, do not compare yourselves because you have such students and so on to your batchmates. Someone's mm. got a job in Oracle, mm. or someone's got a job in IBM, some big one. Someone's got a job in Amazon, mm. uh, and they are now drawing this salary, and I'm not doing that. Mm. And in three years, they after four years, they've drawn started drawing this salary. They are flying business class. I'm not flying business class. You okay. know, it will start coming in your mind. Don't mm. let it play okay. in your mind. Um, because eventually over a period of time you understand that you're creating something mm. and um, and and so and which gives you satisfaction and joy and there is a money trade off and hopefully at the end of it the money that you get for it over a period of time maybe much more when you add up all those salary increases that people get 6% mm. or 4% year on year mm. uh, so but till then stay of course the next is i think of course much has been said about the idea itself mm-hmm. do not start a venture until your idea is firm mm-hmm. okay of course that's a going in position then you'll find a product market fit then you'll pivot all of those things are natural uh, first you'll find a founder market fit mm-hmm. the right for the founder to win in that market then you'll find a product market fit mm-hmm. uh, whether that's a product or a service and use product loosely but all that will happen but you still need to have an idea at the outset my second venture didn't do so well mm-hmm. because we didn't have a, an idea our idea was we'll be a great company okay. that doesn't work it okay. has to be beyond that mm-hmm. or a great place to work so mm-hmm. all my employees loved to work in my place but we didn't know what we were doing so you're talking about the specificity of the idea yeah i think it should be as specific as you can get okay. of course with space to keep changing okay. and it could be completely the other way around mm-hmm. right it doesn't matter but okay. um but have an always have a, a position that going in position um that's the that's the idea and the time for it the total available market and so on. with the team make sure that's the team you love to be with okay there has to be no um you know there will always be disagreements or whatever but there has to be no fundamental issue okay and second there has to be that conversation we talked about who's the who's the king rat among all of them mm-hmm. and then whoever okay. else it has to be it's important and your compensation schemes whether you get compensated now after 3 years when you're profitable doesn't matter when okay. but the schemes and how it will be followed who wants to become like just a as they would call in the earlier days sleeping partner or just a director mm-hmm. or a shareholder or how many external directors i mean having those conversations over a period of time in the first year itself i think is extremely important Okay. So these setting the the foundation right is important. That's okay. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, this was meant to be the last question, but one Please, yeah. uh, point that you m- mentioned, I just want to pick on that. Can you just elaborate a little bit for the audience on? We we have heard a lot about product market fit. What is founder market fit? Yeah, just the why would this founder thrive in this market? So if I say tomorrow I would like to start a uh, an AI and healthcare company. Hmm. Okay. okay, healthcare software for with AI in it. What's my right to win in that market? Why would I win? Mm-hmm. I have no. I'm not a doctor. I have no AI. Whatever. Suppose mm-hmm. I know how to sell to B two B. I know the problem, and I have a good analytical mind. I know which area and all of that. But still, what's my right to win? Mm-hmm. And that will probably determine what kind of co-founders I have to get. Okay. and that will then give me the right to win in that market mm. and then of course we'll come up with the product and the product will have to find its fit okay. in the market but uh, the founder market fit is also important important
very interesting point. I have a few rapid fire questions for you yeah, so it. that <laughs> uh, sure. our audience will get to know you better Absolutely. as a person. Yeah. Uh, some questions for you. Uh, what's your favorite uh, tech gadget that you can't live without? Do you have any such? Mm, used to be my mobile phone. Now I live without it for okay. hours. Yeah. Okay. Are you a morning person or a night owl? I use, so in the last 15 years, I've been a morning person, but that changed, my wife changed that. I used to be a night owl. Okay. okay. And uh, she was a big positive influence on me and uh, changed to a morning person. Okay. And haven't regretted it okay. and will never look back. Okay, cool. Coffee or tea? Uh, tea in the morning, coffee maybe. Okay. Books or Kindle? Books. Uh, okay. Uh, iOS or Android? Android. Okay. Uh, favorite genre of music to unwind? Bollywood. Okay. Uh, one word to describe your personal style? One word. Mm, learning. Constant learning. Okay. Um, uh, beach retreat or a mountain getaway? Mountain getaway. Favorite app on your phone right now? Um, right now? It's Slack. Slack. Okay. Um, if you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? Oh, wow. Dinner with a historical figure. I think it would be Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein. Okay. City life or countryside living? City life. Favorite way to de-stress after a challenging day? Mm, kick back, watch, um, binge watch something with the family. And that was the next question. Netflix binge or a movie night out? Actually, both would, would work depending on the mood. Yeah. With the family together. Yeah. Some things related to business or workspace. Uh, your favorite business book or a podcast that you would like to recommend to others? Um, podcast is, uh, they used, I think they've stopped. It was a BBC podcast, mm -hmm. but I, it was delightful and I still enjoyed it. It's called The Infinite Monkey Cage. Brilliant. Infinite Monkey Cage. Yeah, yeah, yeah very, nice. That. very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Right. And they have like scientists and comedians together. And mm -hmm. it's a fairly scientific topic each, each episode, but also made funny. So quite British in that sense. Yeah, very okay. nice. Top productivity hack that you swear by? Mm, top productivity hack? Um, I would say making notes and then looking at them at the end of the day and putting them in the right place, calendars, etc. Okay. And yourself, I think is, is essential. If you get that right, you'll get everything right. Okay. Uh, what's the biggest lesson learned from a business failure? Um, yeah, the second venture. I have an idea. Don't just go by the glamour of a startup or entrepreneurship. Or okay. Uh, preferred method of brainstorming: whiteboard or mind mapping? Mm, this whiteboard. is a thought that yeah. Whiteboard. Okay, okay. This is something that keeps coming up in the you know um, student uh, ecosystem. Whiteboarding. Okay. Uh, one piece of. But if you ask my daughter, it'll be mind mapping. Mind mapping. So the yeah. new generation, right. they like mind mapping. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Uh, one piece of advice you'd like to give your younger self? Mm, get on with it quick. Define the end objective for yourself, mm. um, whether you want a lifestyle company or not, etc. So don't waste time. Time is not of an infinite horizon. Right. Very apt. Um, favorite quote or mantra that keeps you motivated in business? Keeps me motivated in business. Um, it could be your favorite uh, person also. Your favorite person still remains Bill Gates. And Bill Gates, uh, the okay. reason is that um, you can apply the same analytical mind in so many diverse, uh, diverse disciplines and areas. Okay. All right. Um, preferred communication tool, email, phone calls, WhatsApp, video calls. Um, in... Slack first, actually, hmm. and then email. Okay. Um, most valuable skill that you look for in a potential business partner? What would you look for? When you As a co-founder, you mean? Yes. Um, I would say um, commonness of purpose, hmm. reason why we are doing something. Okay. Fair enough. Top priority while launching a new product, speed to market or perfection? 
Well, speak to Mark. Uh, preferred attire for meeting, formals or business casuals? Um, business, I mean, casual formals. So just like, a, yeah. Okay. You okay. still need to have a jacket, but no, no need of a tie and a full suit. All right. One word to describe your approach to risk. Mm, must take it. Okay. If you had to choose one, cutting edge innovation or time tested tradition? Cutting edge innovation. Okay. Thank I'm you. I'm done with the rapid fire round. Thank you. Thank you so that much. That was very delightful. Those, <laughs> those questions were nice. Roman, thanks so much for being on this very podcast. Welcome. Thank you. And thanks for sharing for those. Oh, uh, it's our pleasure and our uh, honor. And um, you've shared a lot of insights, lots of inspirations. I'm sure our community who's going to be watching this out there will draw their inspirations, the nuggets. And is there a way they can reach out to you if they have some questions? Most certainly, most certainly. They feel free to share my email ID and phone number. But just one advice to the community that is watching it, watch it at 1.25, 1.5 speed. It's a fairly long, uh, <laughs> fairly long episode. So thank you so much sure. for putting up with us. Thank you so much.